The Sony FE 200-600mm 5.6-6.3G OSS lens explained. I'm Sony artisan Patrick Murphy Racy, and off we go. FE refers to the type of lens mount that this lens has. F stands for full frame, E stands for E mount. FE lenses are not compatible with older A mount cameras. FE lenses are compatible with all E mount still and video cameras. Examples of non-compatible cameras would be the A100, the A99, A992, A77, A77 II, and so on. Examples of compatible cameras would be all the A6000 bodies, all A7 and A9 bodies, the Alpha 1, all FX series video cameras, and even the older NEX series video and still cameras. The 200-600mm to is the focal length range of the zoom lens for full frame. If you're using this lens with an APS-C or a crop sensor body, the field of view would become 300 to 900 millimeter. Using a teleconverter on a Sony FE 100-400 5.6 G-Master lens will not produce the same bokeh as this lens at 600 millimeter. Um, focal length always trumps anything converted, so just remember that. Using a teleconverter will not change the optical character of a lens. It just looks through the center of it, or less of the optic. The longer the lens, the more out of focus the background appears. Any focal length 400mm and above is considered to be a super telephoto. The 5.6 to 6.3 refers to the widest lens opening or aperture that's possible with this lens. The Sony to 200 to 600 G has a floating aperture, so as you zoom, it lets in less light. The difference between 5.6 and 6.3 is just a third of a stop, which is negligible. At 200 millimeter, it will be at 5.6. At 600 millimeter, at 6.3. The actual change takes place at 300 millimeter. So really, this lens is a 5.6 lens between 200 and 300 millimeter, and then 300 to 600 becomes a 6.3. Because it affects your exposure, I always set the aperture to 6.3. You must be in either manual or aperture priority to accomplish this. G is the designation of the lens type by Sony. G lenses and G Master lenses are the top tier of what they make. G designated lenses are below G Master in their lineup, but G lenses are used by pros and enthusiasts alike. G lenses are often lighter in weight and offer a wider zoom range than G Master lenses and G lenses cost less than G Master designated glass, and so sometimes they represent a better value. OSS is effectively an internal in lens stabilization system that's inside the lens and will help you with camera shake. OSS works best with IBIS in cameras so equipped. So the combination of OSS with IBIS is the best possible way to get stabilized images and video. Cameras equipped with IBIS will automatically cooperate with the OSS built into the lens. Examples of cameras with IBIS are the Alpha 1, the A7 IV, the A9, A9 II, A7R4, A7R3, A7 III, A6600. Examples of cameras without IBIS would be the A6000, the A6300, A6400, A7, etc. OSS lenses offer cameras that lack IBIS the only way to have image stabilization, so it's really a valuable thing. And remember, OSS lenses improve stabilization for cameras that do have IBIS. Minimum shutter speeds are required at various focal lengths, no matter what you're doing. And when you're shooting super telephotos, it's really, really important to pay attention to this. So as a rule of thumb, use the closest shutter speed to the focal length that you're at, and then add one up. So an example would be, this lens at 200 millimeter, the close shutter speed is 2 50 of a second. If you add one shutter speed going up higher, 500 of a second would be the lowest shutter speed you'd want to handhold pictures at 200 millimeter. But check this out, at 600 millimeter, the closest shutter speed is 500 of a second. Plus one stop going up in shutter speed would be 1,000th of a second. Many shooters zoom in and out without changing the shutter speed, and this is a problem. If you can't find any point of focus across your entire frame, it is more than likely that it's because of camera shake and that your shutter speed was just simply too low. The issue wasn't autofocus, but rather the camera shake on your end. Not everyone can handhold the same shutter speed, so test and test and test. Find your limits personally for what you can do with this lens. This lens is compatible with both the 1.4 and 2x teleconverters made for E-mount. 
The 200-600G plus a 1.4 gives you a field of view of 280 to 840 millimeter on full frame. If you add the 2x to this lens, the field of view becomes 400 to 1200 millimeter. Now, if you change to an APS-C camera with a smaller sensor, the 200-600G without a teleconverter is a 300 to 900 millimeter field of view, as we mentioned before. But if you add the 1.4, it becomes a 420 to 1260 millimeter, and if you use a 2x, it becomes a 600 to 1680 millimeter zoom. Remember that not all bodies retain autofocus with the 1.4 and the 2x attached to the 200 to 600 G. So you may want to check online and see if your camera can or can't. The Alpha 1 with the 200 to 600 G can use the 2x with every feature of autofocus, including tracking and even bird IAF in video. It's pretty astounding. Also, this is something people forget, the same focal length rules apply to minimum shutter speed on converted lenses. So if you have the 2 to 6 G and you add the 1.4 converter, um, the closest shutter speed to 840 millimeter would be 800 of a second, plus 1 would be 1600 of a second. If you've got the 2X on that bad boy, you're at 1200 millimeter. Um, and so the closest shutter speed would be 1250th, plus 1 would be 2500 of a second. So if through your testing you can do better, you can adjust accordingly, but these are good rule of thumbs to use. And last, remember that if you're panning birds in flight, either handheld or on a tripod, even higher shutter speeds are needed to achieve sharp focus because of your increased movement as you pan. And as a rule of thumb, I would do two stops above your focal length as a starting point to test. This lens offers internal focus and internal zoom, which is unique for all other lenses that can attach to a Sony body at this time. Internal focus plus internal zoom means you'll have very little dust inside the optic after owning it for a year and using it a lot. Internal focus means that filters won't spin or rotate as you focus. This is especially true of the variable ND and polarizing filters, which are really make you crazy when you don't have internal focus. Internal focus, internal zoom means that your lens won't creep when you put it down on the ground like on a basketball court or if you are on a tripod and you are tilting down to look down into a valley or something like that. You'll see a lot less creep in these, these types of zooms that have internal zoom. There is no competition right now for a completely sealed lens in this focal length range that will fit on a Sony camera even with adapters. And this video has been recorded in, in January of 22, so that could change in the future. But in my opinion, it's worth the extra money to get 20 frames per second on the A9 and A92 and a full 30 frames per second on the Alpha 1 with the 2 to 600 G. Remember that aftermarket lenses do not allow you to get the fastest uh, frame per second rates on these cameras. So a lot of people are very disappointed when they find out they can only get 10 frames a second or less because if you're using anti-flicker at the same time, it'll be like 8 frames a second or whatever. So, there you go. Front filter or not? Now, every lens I own, except this one and my super wides that you can't put a front filter on, have filters on them. But many photographers have found that adding a filter to the front of this lens can cause focus issues optically and with autofocus. I don't recommend using UV filters on the 200 to 600 G. Adding a front filter appears to change the actual optics of the lens. Having an extra 95 millimeter lens cap is recommended just in case. In the uh, description below, I will list some affiliate links for just this lens, the monopod I talk about, and also a 95 millimeter aluminum screw in cap that's available for transport. If you screw an aluminum uh, front lens cap onto this lens, it's going to be the safest possible way to ship this thing either by air or putting it in a backpack and knocking it into something else. So be, be really careful with this. And remember that you must always attach the lens shade in the proper orientation when you're using the lens to protect that front element. So if you drop the lens or bump it into something and the lens shade is attached, you will not damage the front element. But if you don't have the lens shade attached correctly or if it's not on at all, whatever the first element of glass is breaks and it's the most expensive one in the lens. All super telephotos suffer from the effects of heat waves. Heat waves are most prevalent on artificial turf, like as in a soccer stadium or uh, for lacrosse or football, American and otherwise. 
and on asphalt. So if you're shooting like, you know, basketball out, outdoors in New York City, you might see heat waves. When you see nothing sharp across your frame, zoom out, not in. If you can move closer to subject, you'll trap less heat in between you and your subject. Heat waves can be present even in near freezing temperatures, so watch out for this as you shoot like soccer and things like that. The other way to combat heat waves is to get to a higher position so you're not looking through all the heat. You can look down through it and you'll look through less heat as you go. So getting up into the bleachers at a soccer game or getting into a tree stand if it's really hot in Africa, if you're doing you know, wildlife or wild game, this, these are ways you can avoid heat waves. Many people think the 200-600 is not a sharp lens and because of this issue. Between the heat waves and people not using the correct shutter speeds, the lens has gotten an unfair bad rep. It's a fantastic lens, and it's very, very sharp. Using a tripod is the best way to get overall sharpness in landscape photography. And remember, when you're on a tripod, you can disable OSS on the lens. It's just a switch. You can just turn it off. You can also use lower shutter speeds here, but remember the wind in the trees. If you've got um, a windy day that you're shooting uh, landscapes, remember that you can slow your shutter speed down and drop your ISO, but it might cost you blurry pictures of the, of the trees and the grass blowing. I love using carbon fiber monopods, and these are ideal for the 200 to 600 G, for shooting action especially. At the end of this video, I'm going to actually show you one that I use a lot. So, For best results in panning a moving subject, Use mode two on the lens. It's the, it's the bottom most switch on, the, on that section. Uh, mode two will work best with pans. And for video, you can use ND filters, but try not to stack them. Last, we all love to use graduated neutral density filters in our landscape photography. And I've found that these do not affect sharpness for landscape photography. So that's good news. When I set the lens down, um, I always have the camera head up because this is the expensive part of what I'm doing. It's really, really important to make sure that when you put the camera down on the ground, that you never put it down, head down. Okay, so this is the multi-interface shoe. Um, I also have a, a little plug in here all the time, a little cap, um, just to protect these little points in here. But anyway, on the bottom of the lens, you'll notice that on the, sh on the lens shade, I've got a piece of gaffer tape here. This is really important because every time I set the lens down, pick it up, I'm not scratching the lens shade uh, I'm just putting the marks on the tape. So I shoot a lot of basketball and I'm using this lens constantly, picking it up and putting it down. And yeah, I use this for basketball, but I'm on strobes. So I can be at five, six, six, three, no big deal. But anyway, just having this little piece of tape here is a really good tip for anybody that's shooting sports or birds in flight or late nature landscape, whatever. It's a really good thing to do. One other thing I want to mention is the monopod connector on the lens has two different size holes. So one of them is a quarter 20, which is the smaller of the two here, and then a larger hole here. This is a quarter 20, and this one is the 3 eighths. This is the lens, of, that's the hole of choice. That's what you wanna do. So when you attach your monopod, you basically go to the, the larger one, and if your monopod does not have a, uh, a, a pin uh, that flips over, I would really recommend you get a different monopod because it's just much safer if you're carrying the lens, if you're doing sports and you're running, you know, if there's an interception or something, all of a sudden you gotta, you're in the wrong place in the field, um, that lens will bounce on your shoulder and it can shear that pin right off. Uh, now, even though this lens is lighter, it probably wouldn't do that, but just it's a good practice. So remember, gaffer tape on the, on the lens shade and then always set it down. Never set it down on the camera first, camera head first. You wanna protect the top of the camera at all costs. I'm just one shooter, so this video cannot be exhaustive because it's limited to my own experience. If you'd like to add to this information and help the photo community that we all belong to, please do so in the comment section below. Reading the comment sections of YouTube videos can sometimes reveal even better information than the video has. <laughs> and this is not, I'm no exception. So if you found this video helpful and you gained some knowledge from watching it, please consider subscribing to this channel by clicking on the big red button. Once you click that, a little bell icon will magically appear. If you click that bell, YouTube will automatically notify you of my next video. The more subscribers I get, the more YouTube pays me, and the more videos I can continue to create and make content like this. It's that simple. When you use my affiliate links in the description below, this also helps me a lot. So help me help you and subscribe.
I'm Patrick Murphy Racy, Sony Artisan of Imagery, 